All right. Thank you. Much better. Much better. I kind of like screaming. No, I'm picking. Uh, and so tonight as we look at the book Haggai, we're going to talk about uh, some really challenging thoughts. This is kind of goes back to the rebuilding of the temple. Uh, I'm going to begin tonight in the outline to uh, talk to you about the temple. How, who can tell me how many temples there were in Jerusalem? How many have they built? I'm not talking about synagogues. Now, the big main nation, national temple. Hmm? No? It's either... three. <laughs> you were close, though. You were within 120. All right. Uh, and so, three, really, really, we could even say two, because the one we're going to talk about tonight is the second temple that was built, and then Herod's temple that was there during Jesus' time was basically just an enlargement of the Zerubbabel, this one's called tonight the Zerubbabel Temple, uh, built under the under when he was governor of that area, and uh, built with the support of King Cyrus and King Darius of Babylon, who had. You remember where they are at this time? They they this is the period that they are taken away in exile in Babylonian exile. They're in exile for seventy years. Do you remember why? Can anybody tell me why they're in exile for 70 years? Why God prophesied that they were going to go in exile for 70 years before they had ever left? Anybody have an idea? Say again, Dale. Not finishing God's work, okay. That's one of the things we see tonight, and that's one of the things God's on them about is not finishing this temple but the reason they got sent for 70 years of exile is because of something they had done for 490 years. Maybe I should say something they had not done for 490 years. Hello? Daniel? They neglected the Sabbath, and they didn't, let the, they didn't just neglect the Sabbath. Part of it was they didn't let the land rest. There was supposed to be a sabbatical rest of the land one out of every seven years. For 490 years, they had ignored that. Take one-seventh of 490, and you got what? 70 years. And God made them go away in exile for 70 years to pay for the 490 or the 70 years the land was supposed to lie idle because they refused to let that happen. They were more interested in the money than they were God's care for the land. And so... Tonight we're going to look at this in the book of Haggai, and uh, Haggai, that's kind of like I, how I like to say it. All right, Daniel, here I am again. You got to do something back there? Is that you or me? Okay. No, still not going. It is. Well, no, it was. Must have turned it off. Okay. This is the three temples. The first temple, Solomon's temple, the beautiful temple that Solomon built. What an ornate temple. And that, this plays into this book tonight because this was Solomon's temple was such a beautiful temple. Uh, some of the statistics on Solomon's temple. The, just the inner portion, the building that you kind of see there, which is the holy place and the holy of holies is part of that. Uh, just inside of there, there was a hundred... And, no, 600. Solomon's temple, just inside the Holy of Holies there, there was 600 talents of gold. It layered everything with gold, polished gold. Now, how much does a talent of gold weigh? There's 600 talents. How much does a talent weigh? 140 pounds. It's how much a talent of gold is. And if you add that up, 600 talents, 140 pounds per talent, 
I don't remember, I added it up today, it's, it's like 83,000 pounds, something like that. And how much is gold per ounce today? Like $1,500 per ounce? One talent? I, I probably would have thought it was more than that, but... Anyway, I added it all up, and if you figure it up, they had figured it up in a commentary I'd looked at and said it was only $300 an ounce then, but it's 50, around 50, 14, 1500 an ounce now. But it was somewhere around, what was the number I came up with? Um, equivalent of, of about $20 billion. At $300 an ounce, they said it would have been $4 billion back when... The old commentary, I was reading about 50 years old, and said back then it would have been close to $4 billion at $300 an ounce. Can you imagine that much? Why would they put that much gold inside the Holy of Holies? Why would they do that? That seems wasteful, doesn't it? Okay, God, God didn't really get specific as to how much gold they had to put in there. Solomon, you remember in Solomon's time, he was not only the wisest man in the world, was believed to be maybe the richest man in the world. Because the gold represented the glory of God. And they wanted God to reflect in that holy place because that was the house of God. That was the place where God dwelt. Now that seems a little exorbitant to me. But that was the culture of that. That was what they wanted to state. They wanted that statement to be made about the Holy of Holies and the Holy Place. So you see the Temple of Solomon, ornate, everything first class. And then we get to the Temple of Zerubbabel. Now, in Solomon's day, they are, they're their own nation. They're a, a nation that God was blessing and and Solomon had great wealth, and they could build this great temple, and David had the great wealth. The, Israel was never as big again as it was in David's day. But in the temple of Zerubbabel, the second one you see, which was built, was finished in 515 B.C. It was finished in 515. Now, what we know about Zerubbabel is that not only were they not rich, they were slaves in another country. They didn't have a nickel. They didn't have nothing. They didn't have any gold and silver and diamonds to put in it. But who had all that stuff? God had it all. It all belonged to God. But part of the problem we'll see tonight is they built a poor man's temple here. Because they didn't have a lot of help. They didn't have a lot of gold. They didn't put no 600 talents of gold in the holy of place. And so well, you and I would probably use the term, they just built a a modest temple. They're slaves. They've gone back from Babylon to the King Cyrus started it. Darius finished it. He allowed them to go back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. That was a move of God. That was, I mean, God used a heathen to, do, to accomplish his work. Cyrus, Darius, those guys were heathens. But God used them to accomplish his work. God can use anybody. He can use anybody. If he could use them, he could probably use us. Amen? Probably find the Temple of Herod. I hope it wasn't God saying shut up, talking about the temple, but I don't think so. <laughs> temple of Herod was the one that, like I said, it was the Temple of Zerubbabel, expand, upgraded, more gold, everything fancy in the Temple of Herod. And that's the one that was destroyed in A.D. 70 when the Romans took Jerusalem. And it was destroyed, not one stone left on top of the other. This would have been some kind of semblance of Herod's, I'm, I'm sorry, of Solomon's temple. Beautiful, isn't it? And that's just some of the gold outside. That didn't include the 600 talents inside. That is what we might, it may have looked like, more rough forming of the Zerubbabel temple, the temple we're looking at tonight. And then Herod's temple was more like this. And so you can see the ornate, beautiful pillars over there, and uh, I could have shown you more of that. But let's talk about it tonight. The first chapter is the call to build, a call to renew this temple. That's your first blank on your, on your sheet there. 
a call to build. The background of this, let's look at it. 536, Ezra took 50,000 Jews back to the Holy Land from Babylon. Ezra, the prophet. We've got a book in the Bible of Ezra. He took the first group back, 50,000 Jews, back to the Holy Land. A year later, the foundation was laid for the temple. How important is this temple? How important is it? How important would it have been to a Jew back then? And we're going to relate this to us. So we're not just talking about history here, okay? There's some principles I want you to see tonight. It's not just about history. A year later, the lay, they had finished the foundation. How did they build? How did they, where did they get the ability to do all this? Where did all this stuff come from? How did they lay a foundation for this big old temple? You saw the picture. It'd probably be equivalent to a half a dozen of our church here. At least, or more. How'd they get the stones and stuff to build all that? It was still there from when Jerusalem had been sacked and torn down. And from all the rubble, they found the big foundation stones and they rebuilt. They reused a lot of the stuff that was already there. Here's what happened. The work stopped after 535. Everybody got the foundation built. And here's what you'll see in the lesson they decided to do is take a break and work on their own stuff. They got tired of working on God's stuff. So for 15, 16 years, they didn't build on the temple. Now, that doesn't seem like a whole lot when we look back and we say 535 to 520, 15 years. That's not too much. 15 years. Think about it. That's when your kids were born and now they're teenagers. And nothing had happened on the work of God. And in, Jerusalem, in Israel, that was the project. That was the kingdom work. Now, I don't want you to get hung up on the temples tonight. I want you to think about your church. I want you to think about what God's doing and how this would relate to us. More than just history, God is at work trying to build His kingdom on earth today. And it's called the church, the bride of Christ. And can you imagine if a church for 15 years says, I ain't worried about what God's doing, man. I'm going to get here and do my own thing. I'm going to think about me. This is about me. I got to make my house bigger. I got to make my bank account bigger. I got to get my newer cars. I gotta, this is all about me. It'd be the same effect, would it? What would happen to a church if for 15 years it just said, man, I ain't worried about what God's doing? <laughs> and there are churches out there probably like that have sat there for 15 years and fussed and fought and didn't do what anybody else wanted them to do and what God wanted them to do, I mean. And, and therefore, they just kind of had their own agenda instead of God's agenda. You see, God's agenda is the Great Commission. The Great Commission. And sometimes we get our own commission and do our own thing. But so here in our story today in 520, this is where Haggai, Haggai and Zechariah, two prophets, come on the scene. And we're going to talk about Haggai tonight, how he challenges them to quit so much worrying about yourself and elevating yourself. And let's get back involved in God's work. Let's care about what God's doing. Is there a word for us in that? Hello? Christians, I mean, not just you who are here tonight. There's a word for us for that from God. Don't put yourself in what you're doing. It's, it's not all about you. That's one thing I can say about Rick Warren's book, Purpose Driven Church. He said, it's, it's not about you. It opens up with one little simple sentence. It's not all about you. The things of God, at least. But So they did get back to work. 515, this is a summary of 515. Five years later, the temple was complete. Zerubbabel was the governor. He was the secular government leader, even though he was Jewish. And Joshua was the high priest. And he was the spiritual leader. Haggai, as I said, and Zechariah were the, the other priests. All right, the burden. Here's the burden that Haggai had. He was concerned about, again, this attitude, the concern. The burden, the concern. They were more concerned about their own homes than about God's house. Look at verses 3 and 4. After he introduces uh, himself to us here, notice what he says. He says, Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, It's time for you and yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, and this temple to lie in ruins. Now, let me translate that in modern-day English. 
Why are you only concerned about how nice your house can be? And you could care less about God's house. And then the, the, again, don't just think God's house, the temple. It's God's work. God's work. Why do you only care about you being more comfortable and you don't have time to think about God's work? God's plan, God's vision, God's calling, God's great commission. And you're just focused on you. And he chastised them a little bit for that. He, he puts a strong preacher voice on them, I guess. The consequences, consider your ways, he tells them in verses 5 and 6. That's a good little phrase. All preachers had like to use that. Consider your ways. That's a good sermon right there. Consider what you've been. Consider what you've done. Think about it. Stop and think about it. Does it match what God says? And so he challenges them to think about it. He tells them in verse 6, let's talk about it. Let's think about how you've done the last few years. That's what he's telling them here. You've sown much, but you bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, and you're not filled with drink. In other words, you're still thirsty. You wish you had more water available. You clothe yourselves, but no one's warm. In other words, you're wearing rags instead of warm clothes during the winter. And he who gives, and, and he who earns wages, look what it says. He earns wages to put them in a bag with holes. In other words, in other words, you're not getting ahead. You think you're getting ahead. You're just working yourself to death, and you think you're going to get ahead. God says, I'm not going to let you get ahead. Who do you think put the holes in the money bag? God says, stop and think about it. You say, well, how does God know that this is true? Well, he knows it all, doesn't he? Haggai the prophet says, you, you want to get ahead, but you're doing it. You got your priorities all messed up. He says, you're not getting blessed by God. Why? It's amazing to me today how many times people will do their own thing. They're doing this. They, don't, they think you know, they hide it from the church and nobody knows about it. Maybe they hide it from their spouse and nobody knows what's going on. And They're involved in this, they're involved in this. And then, and then every time something goes wrong, they say, I don't understand. I, I, I'm a member to church. I, I, I give money every now and then when that offering plate comes through there. It's like we're buying God's blessing, you know. But yet God says, you're not clean. The, when something goes wrong, do you ever, do you, I don't know about you, but I do. I mean, I can have a tire blow out and I say, am I behind on my tires? <laughs> you know, I go back and look it up and see, you know, that used to happen to me all the time. I remember when I was a kid. I remember when I was a young man. You remember, Daniel, we worked for Roach Nursery. Well, we were slaves out there, Gary. We was. We would, they stood over us with a, a stick, and if we got out of the way, they, Gary's wife, Kim, her daddy, Tom Roach, they owned all that. And, so we laugh about that every now and then. Two dollars an hour. You work on your knees all week long, pulling grass out of one gallon buckets, fighting the snakes out of the way where you can pull the grass. Swamp, water everywhere, and it rains. Oh, it's terrible. Eighty dollars a week. Eighty dollars a week for slavery a week. Huh? Big money. Big money. But I remember that. I mean, I'd use sometimes. You know, I'd have to pay go out on a date. Women eat way too much when you go on dates with them, and you know you're picking up the bill, you know. And it's just kind of short of money. you got to pay your, you got to pay your gas for your car. And, you know, $80 a week don't go very far. Of course, gas was 32 cents a gallon back then, so that helped a little bit. But, but I never forget, I'd have a flat tire and tire tear up, and I'd say, I couldn't afford to tire this week, God. I didn't have the money to put it in. You know, this was just me. This is just the way I, I just, I, you know, there's a verse over there at the end of Deuteronomy that says, if you don't give the tenth, God will get a fifth. For those of you that's not real good in math, that's not less. That's more. That's not 10%, that's 20%. We are wasteful, aren't we, Brother Ray? And I appreciate you bringing that up, Brother Ray, because that kind of convicted me right there. I'm still kind of wasteful. 
their condition. They were sitting around. In fact, when he talked to them about that, they said it's not time to finish building the temple. Verse 2, look back at verse 2 right quick. Then the speaks the Lord of hosts saying, the people says, the time has not come. The time that the Lord's house should be rebuilt. They were thinking they didn't have to go back to Israel and go back and build the Lord's house, the, the temple, until their 70 years were up. And it wasn't up. They were still in the middle of it. And God said, no. I determine when the house will be rebuilt, not you. And you need to quit worrying so much about yourself and care about what the kingdom of God. I have entered, God had entered a covenant with them. And the covenant was this. God said, I'm going to have some things I'm going to tell you to do. And I'm going to be faithful to bless you. But you're going to have to be faithful to bless me. We're going to both keep our ends of the covenant. And they weren't keeping their end in a lot of ways. All right, our time is, is running out. But I want to say... So he said, stop waiting. They hadn't done anything. They were wanting some king to come along. In fact, King Cyrus had passed a, when he was alive. He was dead by this point. He had said that we will help rebuild your temple. We were gonna, he, in fact, he donated all the things that when they went in and conquered, when Nebuchadnezzar and them went in and conquered the temple in Jerusalem, they took all the gold and silver vessels out of the temple in Jerusalem, and they took them and put them in the temple in Babylon. And he said, we're going to give them back. So that was a lot of wealth right there, but that wasn't exactly something they could spend. It was just going to be so they could do their sacrifices again. So King Darius comes along, and they were waiting, hoping King Darius, so some king was going to put up all the money. You know, churches can be that way. Churches can sit back and say, well, we want to grow, but we're just going to have to wait till somebody on the outside gives us a bunch of money. Somebody's going to have to help pay for this because we're not going to pay for it. And that's what they were doing. They weren't willing to share. They weren't willing to sacrifice for it. And therefore, they had missed out on a lot of what God was doing. The blessing is the third one there, the C. When you think about that, the response to them, verses 12 to 15, um, God tells them here, if they'll take a step of faith, if they be willing to step out in faith, God says, I'll bless you. But they were going to have to show some faith. They were going to have to show a willingness to step out in faith. I gave you the condition, didn't I? Did I miss a blank with y'all? Did you get the blanks off the screen? Okay. The blessing, the response. Here's where the Holy Spirit kicks in. Verse 12. I know I had to skip some verses there. I can't, can't do it all. I don't have time for that. The angel of the Lord appeared, answered and said, O Lord of hosts, how, o, o King, how King... Man, I did some, some uh, cutting with a cutting torch this week, and I don't think I'm going to have to have new glasses, I think. I'm going to have to have new glasses. O Lord of hosts, how long will you not have mercy on Jerusalem and on the, the cities of Judah against which you were angry for 70 years? That's the punishment period. And the Lord answered the angel who talked to me with good and comforting words. So the angel spoke with me and said, Proclaim, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, and God begins to speak to them how he was zealous for Jerusalem. God, wanted, God was zealous for his plans, his great commission, and they weren't as zealous as God was. You know, that's something probably happens here every week. I think God visits us and the Holy Spirit visits us, and he's trying to, to motivate us and inspire us to, to go on and do great things with God. And sometimes it's like God's zealousness for his work is way up here. And sometimes ours is down here. Why? Why is ours down here? Because we're busy with a lot of things, aren't we? We got to stay up on all the soap operas. And we got to watch all the ball games. And we got to mow the yard. And uh, we got to cook meals. And we just got to go to work. And we're just kind of busy. We ain't got time to be all this zealous about the things of God. Or at least that's what happens, doesn't it? Maybe we don't want that to happen, but we get so busy with life, we lose our focus on what God wants us to do. In fact, they had fallen into a time of great apathy. In fact, he challenges them on that apathy. They were so bored about the things of God. In fact, I was, I was looking it up. Some of the things, some of the things 
about how stingy they were with their time. In fact, when the 70 years were up, listen to these facts. When the 70 years were up, of the millions that were taken away in captivity, only 50,000 were willing to return to the promised land. Did you hear me? Okay, here's what happened. All of America, 330 million of us, get taken to Russia as slaves. For 70 years, we live in Russia. We're supposed to keep doing the Lord's work and keep thinking about the Lord. He told them, he said, you're not leaving for 70 years, but settle down, build your house, and, and let's go about life. Let's just go ahead and deal with life. 70 years are up in Russia, and God says, how many of you want to go back to America? Only 50,000 out of 330 million say, yeah, I'll go back. Did I put it in perspective for you? That's the promised land. That's God's land. And of the millions, only 50,000 were willing to go back. 70 years, how much is that? How many generations would that be considered? Two, three generations? You know, you got grandkids that don't even know, you got kids that don't even know what it was like to live in the promised land. That's what we got right now. That's what we got coming up in America. They don't know what it's like to have lived in the promised land. The founders of this nation, what they did to, to establish this nation. They think socialism's still good. Right, right. Think about it. I'm not 70. I hadn't seen the promised land. Thank God I had a mom and daddy that told me every day about the promised land. They painted a picture in my mind about the promised land. And one day I'd want to go back to it. And I, Mom and Daddy said, that's a great place. I want to go back there. That's my home. That's what God gave us. And you see how we can lose our perspective? Particularly if we don't pass it down to the next generation, we lose a generation. You lose a nation that way. That's all i got time to say on that. One other thing. Of the 24 orders of the priesthood, they had 24 of them. Now, the priesthood, I mean, these are the, these are the religious muckety-mucks. These are the ones who ran the religious services. They did the sacrifices. They did, all the, they did all the religious stuff. So you'd think, man, if they get a chance to go back to the promised land, they're going. Of the 24 orders that were there in Babylon, only four returned to the promised land. One in six of the priests returned to what the land. They had probably stood in their pulpits on Sundays and said, said, God is going to take us to that promised land, to away from the promised land, but we're coming back one day. Keep the faith. But after 70 years of liberal theology and buying into the culture of Babylon, they didn't care whether they went back or not. It was cheaper just to stay in Babylon. I guess the word for us here is that we have to be real careful. Seventy years, just 70 years makes a big difference. Think about what's changed in America in the last 70 years. A lot. <laughs> a lot. So, the response. God challenges them. Challenges them to do something with the time that they have. The reassurance. The Jews had to take a step of faith to see God at work on their behalf. Ezra chapter 5 and 6. If you go home and read Ezra chapters 5 and 6, it talks about that response. It talks about Haggai in, in, in Ezra 5 and 6 and how God says, says if you guys will, will just step out there. You, you're wanting to God to do something, but he says you're going to have to step out there and you're going to have to do something and then God's going to bless. But if you're not willing to take a step of faith, you're going to miss out on the blessings of God. They, he tells them to go to the mountains, cut trees. Let's get back down here and start building this temple. Even though we don't know where the money's going to come from, let's just get started. And I believe with all my heart, if they hadn't taken that step of faith, that temple wouldn't have been rebuilt. Not the way they wanted to do it. Not, the way, not at that time. But they did take a step of faith. Then a revival came. The Holy Spirit of God moved in verses 14 and 15 of that chapter. People began to move on to working on the church, and then you know what? God provided a, God provided it a, a, a 
the resources that they needed to rebuild the temple and everything. The attitude. Here's what, here's what happens in chapter 2. Call, a call to behold the attitude. Some of the older members begin to complain. The new temple wasn't as nice as the old temple. And he, the reason I say older members, I'm not picking on you folks that might be older. I'm saying, because he asked them, he said, how many of you were around that remembered Solomon's temple? You went into Solomon's temple. You remember how beautiful it was. And then they were walking around saying, I'm going to tell you what. We had a nice church building before. And now we're in an old metal building. We're in an old metal building. It ain't no good. It ain't near as nice. There ain't no gold nowhere. They daggum cut down trees out there, and they got hauled logs in here. I ain't seen no gold since we started this project. It looks like we're a bunch of pioneers out here trying to figure out who God is. He said, if we knew who God was, we'd have gold everywhere, 600 talents of gold. But they were poor. And you know what God's going to show them here in this chapter? Read it. God's going to show them that it don't matter. This temple was going to be more glorious than Solomon's temple. Why? And he shows them the Messiah is going to walk in this temple. Messiah didn't walk in Solomon's temple. And you want to talk about when the glory is going to show up. When it becomes, when it, when it gets enlarged and added to and a bunch of money is spent on it and it becomes Herod's temple of Jesus' day and Jesus is walking through it. You see, the glory was not in the gold. The glory was in the presence of God. And that's what they were missing. They thought they could be God of God place just because there was gold on the walls. It was so much more than that. It was God place when God showed up. And Jesus was God walking through that place. And that's what Haggai, when he talks about that day, when he talks about what's going to happen, that's what he's talking about. He's talking about when the Messiah. I'm going to show you a term he's got for it in here. For that, that one who would come. So he tells them here, to, let me just say in passing, the attitude was, some of them begin to grumble. The attitude adjustment. I love it when God makes an attitude adjustment. Amen? You ever have to make an attitude adjustment on your kids? Hello? You got a bad attitude. We need to adjust that attitude a little bit. He tells them, verses 4 and 5, be strong. In fact, five times in these two chapters, he tells them, be strong. Be strong. In other words, have faith. Take a step of faith. He goes on the next thing here, the apocalyptic signs. God's going to show his power, and he's going to shake the heavens, verses 6 through 9. He's going to shake the heavens. We're just about through here. He's going to show his power, verses 6 and 7. He's going to show his power. He's going to show his presence. He mentions here a term called the desire of the nations shall come. What do you think he's talking about? He's talking about Jesus. He said, this new temple, the desire of the nations is going to come. In fact, it's capitalized. I thought in my Bible, it's really unique. It helps you see that because it capitalized it in mine. And, and just letting you see that, that the prophet here, some 500 years before the coming of Christ, says the desire of the nations is going to come. He's referring to the day when Jesus would come and walk on the earth. That's verse 7 where he says, the desire of the nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, he says, says the Lord of hosts. Silver is mine, gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter temple shall be greater than the former. Now, there's another temple coming. I want you to be aware of one more temple that's still to come. It's called Ezekiel's temple. And it's a reference to the temple that the Antichrist will start helping to build. It's the temple in the latter days. Okay? It's the temple that the old Antichrist is going to help rebuild. And, and, and the world will be looking to a new form of religion. And so, anyway, but it's believed it's probably a reference to those, as he says here, the latter days temple shall be greater than the former. Some say he may be referencing there 
Herod's temple, but really Herod's temple wasn't a place of peace, as he says there in the Lord of hosts. I believe it's a reference to the temple in the kingdom, in the earthly kingdom, the thousand-year millennial kingdom. There will be a there will be a temple of God. Okay? God's going to show his possessions. He's got all the wealth in the world. If God wants to, if God thinks glory comes from gold and silver, he got plenty of gold and silver. But he don't need gold and silver to be glorious. He's got Jesus. That's his glory. And then uh, number four, God will show his peace. God is a God of peace. He brings peace to hearts and minds. And then last of all, the call to behave. Call to behave, verses 10 to 19. He says there's three things they need to do. First of all, they need to repent. And please hear these last three points. They need to repent. He says in verses 10 through 14, the 24th day of the ninth month, the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to Haggai the prophet, saying, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, ask the priest concerning the law, saying, If one carries holy meat in a field of, of his garment, in, in a fold of his garment, and with the edge he touches bread and stew and wine and oil, does the priest, uh, will it become holy? If he's got something holy and it touches something unclean, will it, will it make that which is unclean holy? Well, no. The priest said, well, no. He goes on down and he says, He said, if one who is unclean because of a, touching a dead body is unclean. So the priest answered and said, uh, He said, uh, if he touches a dead body, touches any of these, will it be unclean? So the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. So in other words, he says, if, you're, if something's holy, it can't make something unclean holy. But he says, if it's unclean, it can make something that's holy unclean. That's what he's getting to here. In other words, what he's saying to them is there needs to be some cleaning up that goes on in the children of Israel. They had missed God's blessings because they were not clean, verse 14 is saying. So this people, and so is this nation before me, says the Lord. And so every work of their hands and what they, uh, what they offer, there is unclean. What does it mean to be unclean? What, is, what does it mean? If God looked at us and said we're unclean, what is he saying? Not that you need a bath because you're dirty. We're not in the center of his will. What did you say? Sin. We've got unconfessed, unrepented of sin. we got things that we're doing that's against God's will. It's not obedience. And, we, and right now, I, somebody could probably say, well, I'm not an adulterer. I'm not a fornicator. I'm not a drunkard. I don't smoke, cuss, spit, chew, dip. I don't do none of that stuff. I'm a great guy, right? I'm pretty good. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says if we know to do good and we don't do it, it's sin. Not just not just the things we do. Sometimes our sin is what we just refuse to do. I refuse to forgive. I refuse to love. I refuse to tithe. I refuse to help somebody in need. That's our sin sometimes. So it's not just what we do. It's what we don't do. And, and, and so he's saying to them, until you deal with this, this temple can never be you as a nation are never going to be blessed the way you want to be blessed. There's a word for us there. That's not a 2,000-year-old word. That's a word for us right there. We need to repent. What are the results? Five times God challenges them to consider the results of their rebellion. They'd been rebelling, and their, their pocketbook had a hole in it. They hadn't been blessed. They'd been, the, the skies were dry. They weren't, they weren't getting the rains that they needed on their crops. They were, everything was working against them just about. And last of all, the resolve. When bad things happen in your life, I say, do you consider your relationship with the Lord? Could it have any part in your problems? I wish I could tell you how many times through the years people have come to me and they've said, Pastor, I try to do what's right. I come to church. I, I give money. and I, go to, I even go to Sunday school. I come on Sunday night every now and then. And still bad things happen to me all the time. I, I, don't, I don't hear what God is saying. I don't have my prayers answered. I don't understand. <clears throat> Let me say, first of all, we don't give. We don't give to get. God's not in the prosperity gospel business. I'm not saying to you, I'm not saying to you, if you give something to God, if you're faithful to God, that God's going to make you rich. I'm not saying that. 
I'm not saying you're never going to get sick if you try to do what's right. I'm not saying that. But I do believe God loves His children. And I do believe He wants what's good for us. And I do believe this. Yes, it's taught in the Old Testament. The Jews thought if you, if you weren't rich, you weren't blessed by God. <laughs> they kind of took it too far. But even in the New Testament, it says God, well, Malachi says it, but it's also repeated how that God, let me just sum it up this way. You can't outgive God. You can't outgive Him. The Bible says He'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on you. And I'm not just talking about financially. I'm talking about some of the ways we give is not money. It's our time, it's our energies, but, but you and I need to understand that God is challenging us here to understand that, that our relationship with Him is something that's based upon, do we love Him? Well, yeah, I love Him. We go through the whole community and everybody say, oh yeah, I love God. Well, do you obey Him? Well, that's a different story. No. God said, if you love me, keep my commandments. And he's not just talking about the Ten Commandments. He's talking about all the things that he taught. None of us do that perfectly. But that sure ought to be the desire of our heart, shouldn't it? And we ought to back up sometimes. And God's telling them, just back up, guys. Back up for just a minute. Pause just a minute. And let's evaluate why there's a hole in your pocketbook. Let's evaluate why it's not raining out there. Let's evaluate why you don't have enough to eat, you don't have enough to drink, your cows are dying. I shot one of mine in the head this morning. That's all right. That's me. That's me. Man, I need to go back and check my tithe. I may not be caught up on my tithe. God done took my cow this morning. <laughs> but, you know, we do have to ask ourselves a question, God. I'm sorry? Amen. Don't turn your back. I, I've never understood people, something bad happens to them, and they just quit going to church. Quit God. Just quit on God because something bad happened. Man, I run to God. I don't run away from God when something bad happens. And so I guess that's how you look at what faith is. My faith is not about me getting something. Faith is about me giving something. Faith is an active word. It means I want to give God something. My time, my talents, my energies for Him. And that's what He's reminding the people when ha in Haggai's ministry in the late. Think about that. This is 2,500 years ago. A long time ago. But the same message is true today as it was to them. Same message. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. Matt, dismiss us, please, sir.